We're going to be in John chapter 12 this morning. John 12, and we're going to read verses 1 through 8. There's also some corresponding uh, passages in Mark chapter uh, 14, just in case you were curious. And then also in Matthew, but we're going to read the account out of John 12. And then we'll also probably refer to at least one of the verses out of Mark 14. I probably shouldn't say this on video, but I dropped my phone in the toilet. <laughs> Look at my screen, man. It's like it's bleeding. It's a good excuse to buy a new phone, right? Yeah, I was ready for it. I'm about to buy that new phone that I wanted. All right, let's go ahead and read John chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. Then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. And the house was filled with the odor of the ointment. Then said one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him, why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence? And given to the poor. This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief and had the bag and bare what was put therein. Then said Jesus, let her alone. Against the day of my burying hath she kept this. For the poor always you have with you, but me you have not always. This morning, my title this morning's message all in. Let's pray again real quick. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that for the next however many minutes that we minister your word, that you would move by the power of your Holy Spirit, Lord, upon every heart, Lord God, and that you'd give us a revelation of all in, Lord, that, that we would hear what your word has to say about that and that you would speak to us in, in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you know, when somebody says that they're all in, it means that they aren't leaving anything on the table. Amen. Uh, they, they don't have an escape route. They don't have a plan B, but they're going to finish the race that they started. Amen. They're they're committed to finishing the race. Let's take a look at Hebrews chapter 12, verses one through two. And we'll read that passage of scripture because it talks about the race. It says, wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us. And let us run with patience the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Look, the word witness there means is martis, which comes from martyr. And, you know, the idea behind the martyr is that it described those people early in the early church who gave their life for the Lord. Still people today that give their life for the Lord. But the word itself isn't just for somebody who died for Christ. The word literally means a witness. Someone who can testify to the facts about the gospel of Jesus Christ. Somebody that can testify to the facts about really the salvation plan of God, which has taken place from the beginning of time, even until where we are in present time. There are people, a cloud of witnesses, the Bible describes, that are there. It's not talking about, I read in the Greek, and I'm not trying to get all definite, but I, I read one commentator, he said, it's not talking about like a defined cloud that you would see in the sky that has limited borders, but really what it's describing is the expanse of the sky. It's talking about all the witnesses that have gone before us. That's what the uh, many people believe that the Apostle Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and if that be the case, then what Paul is saying or whoever the author, what they're saying through the Holy Spirit is that there's a great cloud of witnesses that have gone before the readers that are reading the book of Hebrews then, and also for the readers today that you and I Yes, and, and this great cloud of witnesses that have gone before us are, in a sense, 
to be used as a banner. You ever seen if you go to like a high school where they've had a lot of championships or even in the Superdome and they hang these banners up? You know what I'm talking about? Super Bowl champions, NFC champions. You know what the purpose of those banners are? I go jog at Morgan City High at their stadium and every now and then I'll walk on one little area and they got this little sign up and it, it, it reminisces about the year that they won the state championship. The purpose of those markers are to let the people know at that moment in time that there were some people that preceded them that ran the race, that fought the fight, right? And, and, and in a way, that's what this scripture is doing. It's serving as a banner for, for them then who were struggling, right? If you know the story of the book of Hebrews, these were Christians that were facing severe persecution. Uh, listen, it's hard sometimes for us to live for God in the modern society that we live in because we're concerned about how people are going to view us. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. People that we're close to, people that we care about. We're not willing to be all in sometimes. We're not willing to sell out sometimes because we're so concerned about people that we care about their opinion and how they're going to view us. These people, though, in the book of Hebrews are facing persecution to the point where their fathers and their mothers are turning their back on them. They can't even get a job anymore. That's why Paul, the apostle Paul, had to go around on these missionary trips and take up an offering so that the money could be brought to the poor that were of the body of Christ in the area of Jerusalem, which is who this letter is being written to. They're going under so much persecution that they're being tempted to go back to their old lifestyle, their old Jewish religion, to go back to the sacrificial system, to go back to the faith that they had grown up in. So for you and I, we weren't ever Jews, so the temptation is never for you and I to go back to the sacrificial system. The temptation is for you and I to go back to what we knew before. The temptation is for you and I to go back to a previous lifestyle in order to get some relief. Because listen, when you decide to give your life to Jesus and you make a choice that you're going to live for him, you can bet, you can bet your bottom dollar that the enemy of your soul is going to come after you. He's going to come after you with everything that he's got and he's going to persecute you and he's going to use people that you care about. And, and listen, if he can't get to you right away, he'll attack people that you care about. Let me tell you something. God will allow certain things to take place in your life in order to get your attention. Amen. God is all about getting the attention of his people. Whatever it takes. For Jacob, this isn't even in the nose. But what he had to do, he had to touch him in the hip to where he limped for the rest of his life. God knows how to get a hold of people's attention. These main verses describe this multitude, these cloud of believers through the salvation history. It talks about people like Abraham. If you go back and read, it talks about people like Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It talks about people like Rahab the harlot. It talks about people like Moses, a lineage of people of the faith, witnesses to the fact that no matter what they went through, no matter what they faced, they held on to the Lord and they continued to walk the journey. They walked with God. Countless believers that like the expansion of the sky serve as the purpose of a banner to remind us that there were witnesses before us that faced obstacles and faced circumstances, yet they ran the race and they did not quit. There are multiple examples of heroes in the faith who give everything they had and basically they went all in. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, we hear the story of Abraham. We know, I tell the story of Abraham probably more than any other character in the Bible. These are, these are just quick examples of what I'm trying to use to give you an example. In Genesis chapter 12, verses 1 through 2, it says, Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of your country, from your kindred. What's that talking about? Your, your people. Get, I want you to separate yourself from your people and from your father's house. Unto a land that I will show you and I will make of you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great and you will be a blessing. Now, I mean, we read over that. God only knows how often we've read over that scripture right there since this church has been in its inception. I mean, for the last four years, I mean, if I had to guess at least 50 times, if not more than that. I mean, I'm being legit. You know, I don't want to just throw some crazy number out there. At least 50 times. If not 100. But we just pass over that. We don't really try to put ourselves in the shoes of Abraham and try to consider what it is saying Good, that happened to Abraham. 
Yeah. I mean, come on. He had a family. He had a father. They were very close in those days, in that society, in that culture. They're, the family was everything. They were interconnected with one another. And God said, get you up out of your father's house, away from your kindred, away from this nation, away from this community that you've known all of your life. And I want you to trust me. I'm going to give you a promise, Abraham. Amen. I'm going to give you a seed. And through that seed, I'm going to create a nation. Hallelujah. And I'm going to bless you if you will just trust me. Now, I don't know about you, but I think about sometimes how difficult it is to trust what God's saying. And even whenever and to leave something right, even whenever you know that there's something else waiting for you, because you can see it with your physical eyes. It's like the Lord's saying, here it is. This is where this is where you are. This is where I'm bringing you. And you can see it with your physical eyes. Sometimes still we're so connected to whatever it is that we're trying to hold on to or whatever the case that we have a difficult time separating ourselves and moving on. And here's Abraham. He can't even see anything physically. The Lord, he doesn't even have all of the scriptures to go by. At this point in time in Abraham's life, all he has is the oral tradition that had been passed down through the lineage of Seth that told the story of what happened with Adam. It's not written down on paper yet. None of this Old Testament stuff is written down. This isn't written down until Moses comes on the scene, which is hundreds of years later. Abraham heard the voice of God. God spoke to his heart and Abraham believed God. He trusted the promise. God's plan for Abraham was more important than everything else that he had ever knew before. That's what it's got to be in there. Amen. He was all in. The, the second person was Ruth. Ruth, is, her story is very similar to Abraham, but she was a stranger to the people of God. She was a stranger to the people of God and to the God that had created the nation of Israel out of Abraham. So Ruth comes after Abraham. The nation of Israel is already in existence. It's during the time frame of the judges. And you'll remember the story that there was a man named Elimelech and he had a family. His wife's name was Naomi and he had two sons. And there was a famine in the land and they left where they lived in Bethlehem, which means house of bread. And they went to a place in Moab. They went away from the people of God, from the house of God, and they instead went into the world. How often is it that, that the people of God, whenever they find themselves in the midst of a famine, what does a famine mean? It can mean anything uh, uh, in your life that's causing stress, anything in your life that's causing desolation. And how often is it that the people that are supposed to be the people of God, instead of looking to God, look to something else and venture away from the house of bread where God desires. He says, I am the bread of life. Jesus told the people in John chapter 6 that your, Moses didn't give you that bread that came down from heaven. My father gave you that bread. My father gave, he says that basically he transitions into the fact that my flesh, which is the bread, is true meat. In other words, nutritionally, spiritually speaking, if you are going to survive on this earth and you're going to walk out your life and run the race with God, you're going to have to be fed spiritually with the bread of life. Amen. But here we are in the story of Ruth. She's over there in Moab right now. And there's a famine in the land and Elimelech takes his family and ventures away from God's will and he moves into the world. And the next thing you know, his boys are married to two Moabite women. I don't have time to even get into the history of Moabite women, but you can actually read in the book of Revelation in Numbers chapter 24, the mess that that caused the nation of Israel. But that's another story for another time. These two boys marry these two girls. And then the next thing you know, they both die. They both die and then Elimelech dies and here's Naomi left over here in a foreign land. The choices that they've made, the decisions that they've made have left them in a disarray, left them in a big old mess. Fortunately, Naomi has enough sense that she hears through the grapevine that there's bread back in Bethlehem. Hallelujah. God brought the harvest back. God's replenishing things. And she says, I'm going back home. You two girls need to go back with your, with your daddy. But you know what Ruth says? She makes a comment. Look at Ruth chapter 1 verse 16. This is what Ruth said. See, this comment that Ruth makes, she, it gives us a glimpse into what was really going on on the inside of her heart. Ruth said, entreat me not to leave you. In other words, ask me not to leave you. 
beg me not to leave you or to return from following after you for wherever you go I will go and where you lodge I will lodge your people will be my people and your God will be my God and that, once again you got to put yourself in the midst of Ruth's shoes all of her life all she knew was the Moabite God I mean it's not that important to get into it but his name was Chemosh and he required child sacrifice Whenever, that's what she grew up around. That's all she ever knew. Somehow, some way, Ruth could see that something was different about the people of God versus the people of the world that she had been around all her life. It's, it's like there's no doubt that this is a type of the preaching of the gospel of the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us that knew that God had a plan of salvation, spoke forth that plan, lived out that plan, and it affected people that were around her. Let your God be my God. God's plan was more important than her family in Moab. Amen. She was all in. Paul. The apostle Paul had so much going for him in the life that he was living before Jesus. He was rising in the ranks and gaining power every day. Look at Philippians chapter 3 verses 4 through 8. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinks that he has whereof, he might trust in the flesh. He's talking about in his physical life. He's saying, if anybody had a right to gloat or to feel confident in their accomplishments, I was the guy. That's what he's saying. I was the guy. I had everything that you could imagine going for me. And then he goes on to list it. He says, I was circumcised the eighth day. That's a, that, the point that he's trying to make there is, is that that was the law. That was the word that, was, that God gave to Abraham, that your offspring, your descendants after you should be circumcised on the eighth day. He said, check that box off. My daddy did what was right. I was circumcised on the eighth day, just like the Lord said. He says, he says, I'm of the stock of Israel. I come from the tribe of Benjamin. You can go back and you can look at my pedigree. I come from the, from the stock of Benjamin. That child that was born to Jacob and, and, and Rachel after uh, Joseph had been deceived by his brothers. That's where I come from. He says, I'm a Hebrew of the Hebrews. And as far as the law, I was a Pharisee. Concerning zeal, you want to talk about a burning fervor for the things of God? I persecuted the church. I just knew I was doing the right thing. I did not want this little fledgling operation that was talking about Jesus to get off the ground. And he said, I persecuted the church. He says, he says, touching the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. If you want to look at a man who kept the law as best as a man could keep the law, that was me. That's what he's saying. But what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ. Yet doubtless I counted all things but for loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord. For whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ. I mean, look, you got you to really read through the scriptures to be able to wrap your mind around what the Apostle Paul is actually saying right here. Listen, he went from being on the fast track to one of the most powerful Pharisees known at that time. He had studied under a teacher named Gamaliel, who was the, who, who was the best known Hebrew teacher of that time. And whenever he converted to Christianity, he will tell you in another passage of scripture that he was beaten five times with rods. He was whipped on the back three different times. He was left shipwrecked and overnight in the water. He was mugged, if you will, uh, and, and had him stripped of his clothing and left in the cold. But the crazy thing, he was stoned one time and left for dead in the middle of the street. But the crazy thing about all this is this, is that each and every time that that happened, he just got up and shook himself off. Oh, can I get some clothing to the Lord again? And, and just keeps on walking. Keeps on walking in prison on multiple occasions. Something had to happen to this man to make him have a desire. Something truthful, something real, something spiritual happened at his conversion that transformed his life. Listen, he came to the point where he had no more interest in the things of God. None of his previous successes were important anymore. 
He had been given a revelation of what true righteousness was now, and that was all that he wanted to pursue. He had no more interest in pursuing what the world had to offer. You know, whenever, you, whenever you're in the midst of a situation, I believe this with all of my heart, and the world still has something to offer you, I don't know how else to sell it. It's kind of like still tickling your toes a little bit. Feels kind of, it makes you feel a little bit warm and fuzzy on the inside. You ain't going to leave that. It, you won't leave something that still makes you feel good. But the reality of it is, is that at some point in time, whenever it doesn't leave you feeling good, but instead it leaves you broken and empty and in pain. And then all of a sudden the Lord will show up and speak a word to you. Give revelation to you. Give you knowledge and understanding about what true righteousness is. Hallelujah. Lift the burden off of your back and give you freedom and liberty. Give you feet like hinds feet like a ram would have in rocky terrain and set your feet upon a rock that you not fall or stumble. That the Lord would pick you up and even begin to heal all the hurts of your heart. Only God can do that. Listen, the apostle Paul was all in. He got to the point that God's plan was more important than anything that he had ever accomplished. All of that was nothing but dumb. Listen, if you, if you think that, you know, some college education and some good job and, and whatever the case, that stuff. Listen, by the time I was done getting to my first degree and even working on my second degree, I was such a pitiful mess spiritually. I was a pitiful mess pitiful mess spiritually. I'm just being honest with you. Graduated with honors. First time 3.6 something. Second time with my master's 3.8. Got degrees. I hadn't put them, framed them yet. Maybe one day I will. But it doesn't mean anything because but when it was, I thank God that because of it I was, I have a better job than what I used to have. I don't want to be out there swinging a hammer no more. I don't want to be full of hydraulic oil anymore in the middle of the heat in the sun. Now, I mean, I don't blame anybody that does that. I mean, praise God for you. And I'm glad you got a job because it's a good, noble job. But I don't want to do that no more. And I'm glad I got the job I have. And I'm glad I got that. But it was dung. It, it didn't do anything for me spiritually. And if that was all I had to live life for, oh, you got your master's degree and now you're a nurse practitioner and you help the community be like, I'm just saying, like maybe one day one of the doctors will watch this. And if be so, it was nothing that was meant to be rude or anything like that. But you know how many times I've seen people go through 30 years of work, 40 years of work, and they work all of those days Faithful to this community to serve them. And then they retire and then they play golf for 10, 15 years and then they die. Yeah. What is that? Is that what life is really all about? No. Surely there's more to life than that. Right? Yeah. And I don't say that just to stir your emotions and make you hope for something beyond death. No. There, there is more to this life. And I'm telling you right now that the Apostle Paul was converted and that it touched Ruth. She saw it in Naomi and her family and it touched Abraham. God spoke to it and whenever it spoke to him and whenever they heard the message, they knew that it was real. And what they did was they became they were all in. They left what they had previously known and they were all in. But this morning we're focusing on Mary. We're focusing on Mary, who was Lazarus and Martha's sister. Point number one to my message this morning is that she gave all she had. John chapter 12, verse 3. It says, then Mary, I'm sorry, then took Mary a pound of ointment of spikenard, very costly, and anointed the feet of Jesus and wiped his feet with her hair. I'm just one of these kind of people. I got to look up stuff. You know, alabaster, come to find out, is a form of some type of a calcium deposit that's translucent. And it kind of like is what they make chalk out of. It's, it comes out of gypsum. I think that's a similar type product that they would make sheetrock out of or chalk whenever they grind it up. So you can carve it. But this particular kind is translucent. So they would carve it 
somehow they would put this precious ointment in there and then they'd seal it up. So it wasn't something that had like a cap that you could unscrew the cap and pour like a little, little dab will do you every now and then if you wanted to smell good, that it was in there. It costed 300 pence or 300 denarii. We'll get into that in a second. And whenever you used it, it was all, it was one shot. That was it, right? Now this pure nard was a fragrant oil that was prepared from the roots and stems of an aromatic herb that came from India. It was an expensive perfume imported in the sealed alabaster boxes or flaxes, which were opened only on a special occasion. The value of the perfume was a year's wages, perhaps a lifetime of savings, a whole year's wages, a whole year's worth of work for this one flask. A lot of times that the women would use this and would save a lifetime to be able to to purchase this for the one day whenever maybe they would get married. It was for a very special occasion. They would maybe anoint their bodies with it so that they smelled good for their wedding day or whatever the case. She shows up and she breaks this and she anoints him. Now it says in Mark, and if you take the two passages together, she anointed both his head and her feet. And she wiped his feet with her hair. She used her hair to, 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 to use, to, to spread the oil upon him. And, uh, you know, I didn't put this in my notes, but we, what we're going to see here in a second in point number two is that her worship affected the whole environment around her. Like it started to spread. But you know, one of the things I was thinking, I've said this before and you may have heard me say this before, is that her worship affected everything around them. They all got to experience her, her worship and her love for the Lord. But when it was all said and done, there was only two people in that room that were really, really affected by it. It was the Lord. He smelled like that stuff. And she, she smelled like that stuff. She had been so close to the presence of God that she smelled like the Lord. Her and the Lord smelled the same. Amen. I think that there was an author one time that wrote a book and he was trying to describe this, this scene, and I thought this was really good. That Peter had, Peter had, oh, I feel the Holy Spirit. Peter had denied the Lord, and he was running away from God, and he was feeling all this condemnation and guilt on him. And maybe, this is all speculation, he could have gotten a sniff of that smell that he had smelled in that room on that day, and he probably thought in his heart and mind, Oh, that's the Lord. And he took off running around that corner only to run straight into her. What a thought. That for however many days after that occurrence, she smelled like the Lord. Point being is that she had been in his presence. And when people have been in the presence of the Lord, you know it. Because it has an effect on everything around them. It has an effect on the people around them. I don't really know what the content was that Jesus was teaching about. In the story of Luke, but if you go look at Luke 10, 42, while I don't know exactly what Jesus was teaching, I do know this. Mary was listening. Jesus said, one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. You remember the story? Martha was running around trying to fix everything, working real hard, and she was actually aggravated because Mary was sitting at the feet of Jesus. How dare she? I'm over here doing all this work. I'm doing all this cooking and all this cleaning. She sees how hard I'm working, and look at her. She's just sitting over there at the feet of Jesus, all googly-eyed and listening to the words that he's speaking. The Lord said, she has done the good thing and it's not going to be taken away. So I don't know exactly what it was that the Lord said on that day. But let me tell you something. It wasn't just that day. By now, Jesus has already resurrected Lazarus from the dead as an illustration to what's about to happen with him. She's paying attention to all this stuff. She's watching all of this. She's listening to every word that's coming off of his lips. And in some way, shape or form, I believe with all my heart because Jesus even said it. She has anointed my body for burial. Can't 
proof to you for sure that she knew exactly what was about to go down. But I just feel like Jesus has already tried to tell his disciples what's about to happen when he goes to Jerusalem. And nobody's really listening. You remember the story whenever he says that the son of man's about to be betrayed and he's going to Jerusalem and he's going to be hung on the cross. And what do his two disciples do? We preached about it about three weeks ago. They come up to him. Yeah. Hey, which one of us can sit on your right hand whenever you get into your kingdom? <laughs> nobody listening to him. Mary's listening. She's sitting at the feet of Jesus and she's listening to every word that comes off his lips. Somehow in there I believe that she heard he's going to, he's going to be crucified. Who knows what level, I'm speculating here, who knows what level of revelation the Lord gave her. He's about to fulfill the sacrificial system. All those animals that you, you watched your daddy bring to the temple every time he failed God. Every year when he, when he was going to bring his peace offerings unto God. All those times that you saw these things take place. Year after year, every time you held the Passover. And you remembered the story of how I delivered my people out of Egypt. That's what he's about to do. He's about to go and be the fulfillment of all of those things. And she brought that alabaster box and she broke that box and she anointed his head. She anointed his feet for his burial. Jesus had become the most precious thing in her life. He was more important than a year's worth of work. He was more important than a lifetime of savings. She gave everything that she had. She gave everything she had at that day. That was point number one. She gave everything she had. Point number two, her worship spread. That scripture right there, when we read it earlier, it says, and the house was filled with the aroma. I put the aroma. I think I changed the word from odor. Aroma of the appointment. This is what happens when people worship God selflessly. Their worship emanates from them and spreads and others are affected by it. When I think of the fact that the, her worship was fragrant, I'm reminded about the whole burnt offering in Leviticus. Now, you just got to kind of take my word for this. But all of those Levitical sacrifices that we study every year when we go back through the Bible, in Leviticus chapters 1 through 5, is a sin offering, trespass offering, whole burnt offering, meal offering. All these in some way represent in type Jesus' sacrifice. The sin offering represents the fact that Jesus died for our sin. The, the whole burn offering, though, all of it except the skin was burned on the altar. It represents the fact that Jesus gave everything to the Lord. The fat, the legs, the insides. It was all cleaned with water, but it was all offered on the altar. It shows that Jesus gave everything. Jesus was all in. Jesus gave everything. He didn't hold back. He gave everything that the Father requested. And the result of that whole burnt offering is that it became a sweet-smelling savor in the nostrils of God. I think of her worship and how she selflessly gave all that she had. And the result of that was that it became a sweet-smelling savor in the midst of the room. The aroma of that ointment began to spread. And when people's worship, look at, look at Leviticus 1, 8, ver, uh, chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. <clears throat> And the priest Aaron's sons shall lay the parts, the head, the fat, in order upon the wood, that in the fire which is upon the altar, but his inwards in his legs shall he wash in water, and the priest shall burn all on the, on the altar to be a burnt sacrifice, an offering made by fire of a sweet savor to the Lord. The whole thing. Jesus gave his whole life. As a sacrifice to bring sinful man back to a holy God. And when we live our lives sacrificially, like Jesus gave his life sacrificially. Or when we worship the Lord sacrificially, like Mary worshiped the Lord, we become a sweet savor for God. Look at what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 2, 14 through 16. He said, now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. He's talking about him and other preachers. He said, we give thanks to the Lord because he always gives us the victory. I'm, look, you, I'm, once again, we think we're going through some stuff, man. Every single time the Apostle Paul, not only did he go through all that, but every time he established a church, somebody came in behind that man and told lies about it. 
Said he was preaching false doctrine. Said he was doing, he wasn't preaching the truth. Said he was doing this. Trying to destroy the work that God was, was desiring to do through him. Nobody's ever liked the message that the Apostle Paul preached. Because it said a bunch of rules and laws and regulations and your own self-righteousness is nothing but filthy rags in the eyes of God. And that without Jesus dying on the cross and you putting faith in that, you ain't making it in. And mankind in his religious heart hates to hear that message because he thinks on the inside that he himself is good. Come on, religious man, religious woman. You know what I'm talking about. Surely you yourself have experienced it in your own life. If you haven't been able to see that you've been that way, you might still be there right now. Amen. I'm just saying. There's, there might be a little piece of it still hanging on that prevents you from being able to see the fact that without the precious blood of Jesus dying on the cross, without that great exchange taking place where he took my sin upon him. Listen, scripture says, while we were yet sinners... Christ died for the ungodly. The devil wants to continue to lie to us. Amen. Oh, you really did it this time. Oh, you really went too far this time. And what does he do? He heaps condemnation and guilt. He heaps all of these feelings of unworthiness and telling us that, well, no, no, you can't never be right with God again. Look at what you did. Even whenever you knew it, he's a liar and the father of lies. Right. Jesus went to the cross. He said, it is finished. He took the guilt of mankind upon him and he gave us his righteousness in exchange. But when you turn around and you begin to think that what you do is going to be pleasing in the eyes of God, or I'm not saying that you can't please God because we're about to talk about it. You can become a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. But if you start thinking that you look at me, well, I'm a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. The apostle Paul can say, because he's saying it from the right perspective. He's saying it from the right motive. He knows what somebody giving their life for the work of the ministry means to God. It means a big thing. But when you are lifted up in your own mind and haughty and full of pride and thinking that you're better than somebody else because of what you do versus what they do and that you now have established some position with God, that's not a sweet savor in the nostrils of God. Paul says, we thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Even though we get beat sometimes, whipped sometimes, thrown in prison sometimes, people coming behind us and lying on us, he still gives us the victory. Amen. And makes manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Every place we go, when we speak forth the truth of the gospel, he makes manifest the savor of the knowledge that he's given us. When we speak forth his knowledge in the crowds where we preach, the savor of God is like an aroma that came off of what Mary was doing when she anointed Jesus' feet. In the spiritual realm, it's like an aroma when the truth of the gospel is being preached and the seed of the gospel is being thrown and it's receptive in people's hearts. He says, for we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved and in them that perish. What you talking about, Paul? To the one, we are the savor of death unto death. And to the other, the savor of life unto life. And who is sufficient for these things? See, for the believer that lives for God and witnesses the gospel for God, there is a result. The result is that some are softened towards the gospel and are saved and others are hardened towards the gospel and will ultimately be condemned. That is a powerful word that should be sobering to each and every one of us in this room. Brother Larson used to say this, that the same sun that softens butter hardens clay. The same, and I'm going to add this, that the same gospel that softens the surrendered heart also hardens the rebellious heart. That brings me to my next point. Point number three, her extravagant worship caused others to become hard. Her extravagant worship caused others to become hard. Let's look at, we're going to look at both John chapter 12 verses 4 through 5 and Mark 14, 4 through 5. In John 12, 4 through 5, it says, Then saith one of his disciples, and it tells us which one, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, which should betray him. Why was not this ointment sold for 300 pence and given to the poor? Now, John goes on to tell us that the only reason that Judas even said this was because he was a thief. John was able to look back in history because it's probably about... 
30, 40, 50 years out before he writes this gospel. And he like had all this time for the Holy Spirit to remind him. He probably saw Judas like he probably saw something that looked a little fishy at some point in time. But he didn't really put two and two together. You know, sometimes there can be something so plain in front of your very eyes and you still miss it because you're just so naive. You know, I would never have thought Judas would have done that. He was one of us. But now when it's all said and done, he realizes that the only reason that he said that was because he was a thief and he wanted to keep the money for himself. But look what it says in Mark 14, 4 through 5. Not only was it Judas. See, when Judas said that and acted that way, Mark tells us another side to the story that it affected the other disciples too. And there were some that had indignation within themselves and said, why was this waste of the ointment made? For it might have been sold for more than 300 pence and have been given to the poor. And they murmured against her. It wasn't just Judas. It was also the other disciples. People, look, when one person starts talking trash, next thing you know, everybody else gets all involved. Their heart gets hard. Oh, I knew they wasn't doing it the right way to begin with and all this other kind of stuff. And it never does any good for, for us to go bad mouthing and talking. I mean, I can't say I ain't never done it. I'm just saying I know good and well it doesn't do any good. What ends up happening is you just get bitter in your heart. You get frustrated in your heart. Right? Instead of instead of wanting to see what was really going on. Look, there's another scripture in 2 Samuel 6, 16. We're, we're talking about extravagant worship, selfless worship, and the effect that it has on other people. Sometimes it can have a good effect. Amen? Sometimes it can have a bad effect. Look at this. And as the ark of the Lord came in to the city of David... Michael, that was his wife, Saul's daughter, looked through a window and saw the king, saw King David leaping and dancing before the Lord, and she despised him in her heart. In both of these stories, the intense worship of someone causes envy in someone else. I don't know if you've ever experienced that before. You know, in Judas's case, he was just full of sin, and he just wanted the money. But in some way, it affected everybody else. But I can tell you that there have been times in my own life, I, I use myself as an example because I've experienced certain things spiritually, and I can say that something wrong was taking place in my heart, and that God revealed to me what was going on, right? And so if I can use that to hopefully help, maybe you felt something also, and I'm backing it up with Scripture, then it happens. It happens to be, you never really know what's going on inside somebody's head. You know, the only way you can really know is if they tell you or the Lord gives you a word of knowledge. What A person can be telling you one thing with their mouth, but boy, look, right. could be a whole lot of other stuff going on in their head right. and inside their heart. Oh, right. Come on. And the enemy is more than happy to help them. <laughs> oh, he's going to whisper. And sometimes we happy to help him because we've done wrong. Right. And then the enemy takes our wrong and he makes a nice little gumbo. Boy, like it serves it. But there have been times in my life that I've watched people do what they called worship. And I've even told stories before. And I felt as though that what they really were trying to do was they were trying to take people's eyes off of the Lord and put it on them. Right. You understand what I'm saying? Because it, it just didn't feel like it was right. Yeah. But then there's also been times where my heart wasn't right with God. And there were people who were sold out to the Lord and worshiped God selflessly and sacrificially and with extravagance. And I have to say that I didn't like it. It made me uncomfortable. I mean, there was a time where I remember whenever Aaron, whenever before the Lord had really gotten a hold of me, I was at the end. I had just graduated nurse practitioners. And so you remember what I just told you at the beginning of this message? I was spiritually a mess. And I can remember, man, we'd go to service and Aaron was so excited for the Lord. I'm telling you, he'd be like jumping up. He, he don't do that kind of stuff too much anymore. Well, I don't I hadn't seen him do it in a long time. I mean, he'd be jumping way up in the air, like six foot five and getting his leap on. And I was like, look at this dude here. I'm sitting in the back like, oh, Lord, here we go. And my heart was just so hard. I'm like, man, this dude. He, and I mean, I, I mean, I loved him, but it did something to me. I'm just trying to explain to you what was going on. What I know that I didn't know then was that I was convicted by the fact that he was all in and I was only halfway. The same thing goes with the guy that we've been praying for that got the colon cancer. 
Now, he's been walking around the country carrying a cross for I don't know how many years now. And you can think whatever you want. That's where I got the idea to carry the cross a few times I did. I went with him one time to Bourbon Street, and I don't even want to get into that. That was just an amazing thing right there, preaching Jesus on Bourbon Street. And the things that people did to him, I can't even repeat in the congregation. And he, and he just kept on going. And I was like, dude, do you see what people do behind you? He's like, oh, man. He knew what they were doing. He wasn't even worried about it. They just over here preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. And, but I got to tell you that now this was after the Lord had gotten a hold of him. But before when I first met him, he came to Cornerstone. And that was whenever I was all jacked up. Mr. Paul invited him to come eat. I remember Joshua gave him his Harachi sandals. Get, get, you know, whatever. So he's over there eating, and I'm over there sitting in there in the living room thinking, who does this dude think he is? Carrying his family all over the country in this bus. I'm not saying he did everything right, but this is what I'm just telling you what was in my head. I'm thinking, this dude here, he thinks he's something else. And you know what I realized later? My heart was hard, and I was convicted by the fact that he was all in. And then I was only halfway. And whenever I say that you got to be all in, I'm not trying to say that you can't still have a job. I'm, not, I'm just trying to say that you're making the decision that you're going to serve the Lord. And your kindred and your family and your nation and everything that you knew before and all the things that seem to be so important to you aren't going to prevent you from being all in and giving your heart to the Lord. Look, God isn't okay with halfway. Revelation chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. He said, I know your works. You're neither cold nor hot. I wish you were cold or hot. So then because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. God's not okay with halfway. Look at this. Now we're on point number four. We're about to close. And I just wanted to leave you with this thought today that the story of our lives <laughs> is still being written today. Amen. Amen. It's not over with. Wherever you are right now, whatever it is that you're going through, it might be good, it might be bad. I'm here to tell you the race is still to be run. It's not over with. Don't let the devil lie to you and tell you that you're going to have to finish the race the way that you are right now because this is just one leg of the journey. Amen. And it isn't over with until it's over with. Praise God. Mark chapter 14, verses 8 through 9. The story of our lives is still being written today. It says, she, this is Jesus talking, she has done what she could. You know, I was reading that this morning, and I did, I highlighted it, because it hit me this morning when I was reading it. He said she has done what she could. He's, he never asked any of us to do everything that he did. He didn't ask me to do what Brother Swagger did. He said, she has done what she could. It's like the parable of the talents. I give you a certain amount of talents, and now I'm expecting a return on what it is that I've given you. I'm coming back to see what it is that you've done while I've been gone. Now you can sit here and twiddle. We can sit here and twiddle our thumbs and act like, well, he never really gave me nothing. No, hold on a second. You either in or you're out. And, and, and if you're going to be in... I don't know what they're preaching down, you know, in other churches today. Well, I do to some extent, but let me just tell you this. If you read the word of God for face value, one of the things that you're going to know beyond the shadow of a doubt is that God has always expected his people to be separate from the world. And he has always expected his people to be a voice and a mouthpiece for the world around them so that they would know that he is real. Without the testimony of the cloud of witnesses that have gone before us, without the testimony of witnesses today, then nobody that we know would ever know the gospel. That's right. Oh, but now they got preachers on TV. Half of them aren't even preaching the truth anymore. Amen. Should the Lord tarry, I'm telling you, the remnant is going to be smaller and smaller. I believe that. I'm not saying it's not growing, but what I'm saying is is that more and more people are being confused by false doctrine and, and, then, and, just, and just separating themselves from the truth to the point where right now, we have so many people that go to various churches that it's like it was for the time in the times of Israel that we're about to get into on Wednesday nights in the time frame of the kings. When they literally, I think I said this last week, brought idols into the temple and thought they were worshiping Jehovah. That's how confused they were. That's how confused so many people are in the church today because they've been raised in false doctrine. They've been raised 
and affected by the word of faith doctrine. The confess it and possess it doctrine. That you're, you know what the, the root behind that teaching is? That you're a little God and you can speak things into existence. That just like God did. That is, that's blasphemy. That's not the, that's not the scripture. And, and, and that's just one example that has affected people's mindset. I don't really know why I got off on all that, but look, this is what she has done. She did what she could. Are we doing what God gave us the talent to do? Are we doing what God gave us the gifting to do? It says, she has come aforehand to anoint my body to the burying. Verily I say unto you, this is so good. The story is still being written. Wheresoever this gospel shall be preached throughout the whole world, this also that she has done shall be spoken of as a memorial for her. Oh, man. Praise God. Her story. Another thing I thought about this morning is comparing her to Judas. When you read the story of Judas, what are you left with? Jesus said he was the son of perdition, only lost one. The son of perdition. That the scripture might be fulfilled. His life ended with him hanging himself because of condemnation and guilt. There was no salvation for him. Even the money preachers will try to preach something different on that. They want to try to save Judas. No, Jesus said he was the son of perdition. He was, he was possessed by Satan and he betrayed Jesus. And when it was all said and done, the remorse and the condemnation affected him so badly that he hung himself and died in the middle of his sin. But what the scripture says right here is that her worship will serve as a memorial forever. You may find yourself talking to you in a spot in your life where you feel hopeless that you failed God or that he can never use you again. But I have to tell you that your letter is still being written today. That's right. Amen. He's not done writing your letter. It, the word memorial means a reminder. It's a record. Her story serves as a record, hallelujah, that some girl lady that loved Jesus, that was willing to listen to his words, was overwhelmed and she was all in and she gave what she could. She gave what she had and she proved to Jesus that she felt like he was worthy. He was worthy of glory and honor. He was worthy to be lived for. He was worthy to be praised. He was worthy to be worshiped. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. Paul says to the, to the people in Corinth, he says, you are our epistle. You know what an epistle is? Huh? I've told you all about that before. What does it mean? Letter. Letter. It's a letter. Paul said, you're, you're our letter. You Christians over there in Corinth, y'all are some messes, <laughs> but y'all are our letter. You're, you're the letter written in our hearts. And you're known, this letter is being known and read by all men. For as much as you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us. In other words, we come to the church of Corinth, we preach the gospel, you respond by faith and God is changing your life. You become a letter for people to read. He says, it's written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but in the fleshly tables of your heart. The gospel of Jesus Christ, reaching in, changing lives, becoming a letter for those around them to read. The content of the letter tells a story about how the gospel changes people's lives. Similarly, her worship affected the people around her and the letter of our lives that tell the story of the change that the gospel brings affects the people around us. Jesus said that the record of her life will remain as long as this gospel is preached. As long as this gospel is preached, others will hear the story of this faithful follower of the Lord that gave everything she had to glorify him and show her thanks and devotion to him. And will, as long as this gospel is preached, have an effect on countless people through thousands of years of human history. How many people you think have read the story of this woman and the Holy Spirit just ministered to their own? You know what I'm saying? I mean, people have written songs, whether you like, you like the song or not, because she talks about like wine for the Lord to drink. She says, like oil upon your feet, like wine for you to drink. I pour my love on you. I pour my love on you. It's like, she, you know, but what she means by wine for you to drink, she's talking about a drink offering. 
The Old Testament drink offering. Pouring one's life out for the Lord. That's what it represents. Like oil upon your feet. Like wine for you to drink. I pour my love on you. How many people have been ministered to by that song? I'm going to tell you right now, that song has touched my heart on more than one occasion. The story of her life recorded in Scripture. You know, while the letter of our lives will never be in Scripture, the letter of our lives is still being written today. The letter of our lives is still read by others today. The letter of our lives is, are being observed by both God and angels today. That's a powerful thought to me. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. I just got a couple more scriptures and then we'll go. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 12. It says, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister these things. So what is he talking about? He's saying Old Testament prophets that spoke the word of God didn't even really necessarily know exactly what they were saying. They spoke as God gave them the word, but who they really ministered to was us, who now have the revelation that Jesus was the fulfillment of all the things they promised. Does that make sense? He says, unto whom the prophets, it was revealed, the gospel, that not unto themselves, but unto us, they did minister these things, which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven. Hallelujah. You know I mean? The prophets of old spoke forth of the things that were to come and now mixed with the Holy Spirit that was given to us as he came down from heaven. When Jesus went up, he came down. And when he came down, tongues of fire, hallelujah, on the disciples' head, filled with the Holy Ghost. Now with the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the gospel going forward and reaching out and touching and changing people's lives, which things angels desire to look into. Angels are watching this whole thing played out on earth. The angels are amazed by redemption and they become filled with joy every time a soul is saved. Look at Luke 15, 10. It says, likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one center, sinner, sorry, that repents. They, they, the Bible said in the Peter passage that they that they look into. And I know I've preached this probably five times since we started this church because I just love this idea. So if you get tired of it, I'm sorry. I mean, I'm not really sorry, but I mean, whatever, take a nap. But what I will tell you is this. I just love the thought of it because it's kind of like they're peering over the portals of heaven. They're looking over. It. The idea in the Greek is that they're, that they're on the cusp and they're looking over because they're like intrigued. Just like Mary was intrigued at the feet of Jesus and every word that was coming off of his lips. The angels are like looking over into this thing called redemption. Think about it. I know I've said it before, but come on, somebody work with me here. Angels don't know what redemption is. The only thing they know about redemption is what they see played out on earth. No, you're either a good one or a bad one. And if you went the way of Satan, you don't get a second chance. You saw God. I don't mean to get all philosophical on you, but they saw God with their celestial eyes. They saw him for who he was. They were able to be literally in his presence and they still rebelled against God. You and I, because of the fact that we were never able to truly see, I believe that has something to do with it. I'm, this is just Matt's commentary right here, but it has to have something to do with it. That you and I never were able to see the physical representation of God other than in Christ Jesus. And because of that, we got to believe by faith. But they saw God on the throne and yet rebelled. There is no coming back for them. But yet they watch played out on the stage of human lives every day. The gospel preached, soul saved, joy in heaven, peering over, looking into this thing called redemption that the prophets of old spoke of. That the Holy Ghost came down and anointed the preachers today to preach. Hallelujah. That people respond through faith. That their lives are changed. That they turn around. They go all in. They worship the Lord. Hallelujah. With extravagance. And the aroma of their worship spreads from them. And it begins to affect other people. Amen. So Listen. What are you trying to say, preacher? You want me to go get an alabaster box and start breaking it on people's feet in the middle of work? That's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about living your life as worship for the Lord. Whatever that means. Look, 
I'm gonna use I use Robert as an example all the time. Most of the time I talk about his old days, and so this I'm gonna talk about some newer days. One of the things whenever we first started having the Bible study that Robert had mentioned to me was, man, one thing about you know all of us coming together at this Bible study has done for me as we talk about the gospel and as we see in the scripture how the New Testament church operated and as we pray for one another in this Bible study and we talk about bringing our faith out into the world, he said, dude, I've been more, had more boldness to tell other people about Jesus and to actually lay hands on people and to pray for them in public. And listen, once, when somebody allows you to lay hands on them and pray for them, you're not going to tell me that something doesn't happen in the spiritual realm. All I'm trying to say is I'm not even trying to tell you to run out and try to lay hands on everybody. The Bible says don't lay hands on any man suddenly. But what I will say is this, is that to be led by the Lord, to be a voice for God, to allow the worship of the Lord to come out of you and to affect those around you.